Welcome everybody to the Monday Motivation Spotlight. I'm Leslie Kaplan, welcoming you here live every single Monday and bringing you quality and inspiring guests. Yes, every single Monday. So if you're joining live, that's awesome. I always love it when people join live because then you get to feel the vibe and you can also get to ask questions and make your comments in the chat. And I remind you, especially for those of you that are joining for the first time, that if you're a business owner, although this is not an official networking group, feel free to write your details in the chat, including posting your links, and then people can see you in that way. It gives you additional exposure. So today, if you are watching the recording, by the way, thank you, and I welcome you to join us live whenever you like, because there's just a certain type of vibe about joining live. So who do we have for you today? I'm going to replace my spotlight with her. Hello, Eliana, Dr. Eliana Aaron, who I'm Hi. so privileged and honored to meet. So who is Dr. Eliana Aaron? Well, her bio, she just comes with an amazing bio, and then I'm going to add something a little bit afterwards. So she is the executive director and co-founder of the Hinelu Foundation, and we're delighted also to have her brother, Yigal Marcus, here, who is also a co-founder, and I think there are more co-founders too. I'm not sure you'll tell us about it, which was an amazing, amazing initiative at the start of the war. She is also the director of Emma Care. She's a healthcare policy. She's a clinician. She's definitely an innovator. She has a doctorate from Yale, and she has 25 years experience dealing with clinical experience and healthcare, uh, including with the U.S. Embassy in Jerusalem. So if that's not enough for Hubaya, I will add that we had actually scheduled the date for Eliana to be our guest uh, earlier in the month, and the result of she just married off her daughter recently. And believe it or not, she said yes to accepting the day before the wedding, which just shows you how much of a go-getter she is. And I was the one that said to her, once I discovered at the time when we had initially booked it, the date, I didn't know if she was making a wedding the next day. I said to her, no, you know what, Eliana, I think that's not a good idea. I don't want to know show at the last moment. I don't want you to be under pressure. But it just shows you what a positive, inspiring and go-getter person she is. So welcome, Eliana. We're delighted to have you here. Please share with us your story, your Aliyah story. I know part of your family, and I know that you're very big Zionist, and it was obviously as part of, you know, your blood growing up. So please share that with us, as well as how you got to found Henenu, Emma Care, and anything else inspiring that you would like to share with us. Great. Well, first of all, Leslie, thank you so much for having me on. Um, it's my pleasure to be here. And um, I love uh, talking to Olim because everybody has a unique story. And I think every Ole has something to contribute to this wonderful country of ours. And, uh, and really that was one of my goals in moving to Israel was to be able to contribute to Eretz Yisrael and, um, and to raise my family here. So um, we made Aliyah 22 years ago. I was raised in a... Uh, very Zionist home in Teaneck, New Jersey. My father, Dr. Menachem Marcus, was um, one of the founders of Efrat. And um, so I grew up with uh, Tzionot, Zionism, really in my blood. Um, and, um, and we made Aliyah during the Second Intifada. Um, and we were the only people in our family here. At the time, I had three young children and from age two to seven at the time. And um, and we decided, you know, that we were gonna do the move and uh, which is scary. Everyone here who's made Aliyah knows there's, it's a little scary. Uh, we moved to Nofay Alone, which is a town right outside of Modian. At the time, Modian was not a very big city. It was, uh, I don't even know if it was considered a city. Um, there was like one supermarket at the time. Now it's a pretty big city. And um, and our experience of making Aliyah was positive. Um, I uh, interestingly, within a few months of making Aliyah, I had a personal medical crisis, which really highlighted for me the importance of ha having some having someone to help manage healthcare because when you're sick it's very hard to take care of yourself. I'm a health provider. I speak Hebrew fluently. I worked at Hadassah at the time. And I still found myself a little bit lost in the system, despite all of that. So um, 
so uh, I started realizing that there are some gaps in the system. And that's a, a theme I explored a little bit later. Um, a couple of years later, um, I got a job at the US consulate in Jerusalem at the time as a medical officer. And that was a very interesting job. Um, I, I was actually working as the first nurse practitioner in Israel at the time. So that's years before it became uh, uh, normalized in Israel and became part of the health system here. Um, and that meant that every interaction I had uh, with um, the public health system was me explaining to people what I was and what I do because they didn't understand. Um, I had a lot of uh, very interesting stories. I could probably write a book about my experiences at the consulate. Um, I worked with uh, the White House and I worked with all of the governors and senators and all of the American uh, VIP government people who come to Israel. I was the medical point of contact on um, in Israel um, and I was coordinating the medical um, plans. Um, and if there were medical issues, I was coordinating on the ground along with the teams that were coming in with them. Um, and that was very interesting. I got to work with a lot of people. Um, I met a couple of presidents and, uh, and other people. And, um, and I worked very closely with them. Um, and I also realized at the time that there's another population that has uh, gaps in the health system, and that was diplomats. And I said, why, why diplomats? Why do they have an issue? Um, they're not part of the healthcare system, and they don't speak Hebrew. Um, and I thought, okay, so now I'm registering that there are certain gaps in the Israeli healthcare system, and this is all going through my head. At the same time, I was volunteering to help Olim, who ended up in the hospital, and and Nefesh Benefesh was calling me and saying, hey, can you visit them and give them some chizuk? So I would go to the hospitals and visit with the families and try to give them some chizuk. And... Um, and it was an interesting experience, but I was gathering the information that all of these different populations really had some gaps in the system and they weren't able to access uh, care the way um, native born Israelis were able to. Um, I started uh, graduate school. Uh, so I started my doctoral program at Yale in 2012. So um, I did a clinical doctorate and I was commuting to Yale. Um, and that was a great experience. Um, I did 21 trips in three years, a lot of trips, and I had three little kids at home, so it wasn't so easy. Um, and uh, I really focused on the populations in Israel that were having, um, that were not able to access care in an equal way. For example, Olim are 400 times as likely to use emergency rooms as non-Olim. And, and that's an incredible statistic. So if you're Israeli, you're much less likely to use an emergency room. Why do we go to the emergency room? Number one, because we don't know where else to go. It's not that we have more emergencies than an Israeli, a uh, native born Israeli. It's that we don't know how to get help before we need that emergency, uh, that emergency room. So uh, Olim don't use as many specialists as native born Israelis. These are some of the interesting gaps that people don't realize. They don't, they don't know how to utilize the system optimally. Um, and when I saw those numbers, and then I also saw some of the numbers about the elderly population in Israel and how difficult it was even for Israelis to, to navigate complex situations, I realized, you know what, this is really what I need to do. I need to help populations in Israel that don't have the same kind of access as other populations. So when I finished um, my studies, I started a, a company called Imacare. And, um, and Ima Care is, uh, my daughter came up with the name. Ima is Eliana Marcus Aaron, by the way. <laughs> and- I, I um, thought it was Ima like as an Ima mother, which is also right. a good planet. Yeah, it's, that's how we pronounce it is Ima Care, exactly. Ah, okay. um, yeah, but it happens to be my initial, so it worked out um, kind of uh, in a funny way. 
but it also um, sort of engenders in our minds this warmth and I'm gonna take care of you feeling when you hear the word Ima. So we want that. We want people to feel like someone's helping them and caring for them. Um, and what we do in Ima Care is we help to manage the health care of people who um, need better access and need someone to help organize the, the care and to make sure they're getting everything that they're entitled to um, in the system. And that they're looking, we're looking from the outside to, to optimize, to make sure that, you know, if some things, you know, your family doctor in Israel has about six minutes to talk to you. So sometimes you don't have the time to explain the situation, to give you the um, education that you need to help yourself. Um, and we really want to take the time to help people and to get them really great access to care. And that is our goal, either um, just through regular care or when they're managing a crisis. So that is something that we do. And uh, we've been doing it for nine years, uh, which is really exciting. Um, and um, uh, we and I also work with other populations that fall through the gaps, not just Olim and not just the elderly, but I work with students and tourists, other people who aren't able to access care as easily as, uh, let's say, what I'm calling a native born Israeli, because we're all Israeli here. Um, so basically, uh, that's Ima care. And um, we identify problems and try to fill the gaps. And it's very exciting. And that's one of our goals. Now, as I lived here, I started marrying my kids off. My brother made Aliyah um, and, and my parents made Aliyah about nine years ago. And um, and so we weren't alone anymore, which is really exciting. Um, and, uh, and eventually my sister also made Aliyah. So half of our family is here. Um, and that's a wonderful thing. Um, on October 7th, um, we were celebrating my father's birthday. My siblings from America were here. I have two brothers in Boca Raton who are both physicians. And um, and we, we had two days before October 7th, we had this party for my father. And October 7th happened. And Yigal, uh, my brother, was with my brothers uh, from America. And he said to them, listen, if Israel needs you to volunteer, would you, would you volunteer? And they both said, yeah, of course we would. So Yigal, you know, kind of said to his wife, Karen, uh, you know, um, I'm, I'm curious, like, yeah, it's interesting. I wonder how many other people want to volunteer, you know, that that's, that's very interesting. On October 8th, Karen wrote to her chat group in Hashman Ayim, hey, if anyone knows doctors who want to volunteer, so tell them to call Yigal. And that was not such a good idea because, sorry, I muted myself by accident. Um, that was not such a good idea because Yigal got 200 phone calls in the first few hours and no one can handle that. So he called me and said, Eliana, what should I do? Um, so I quickly put together um, uh, a registration page and, and we decided that we were going to do this. And within two days, we had 5,200 volunteers registered. And, um, oh, and no. yeah, it was, it was really, uh, it was, un we did not expect, and we did no advertising. This was all word of mouth that started from Yigal telling his wife, I'm wondering if people want to volunteer. And it just spread like wildfire. We were registering people before there were any other registration sites. Um, and, uh, you know, in that first week, even, we got phone calls from hospitals around Israel that were absolutely desperate to get help. Um, one hospital in the Merkaz, Wolfson Hospital, they called us and said, all of our pharmacists have not come to work. Now, remember that at the beginning of the war, a lot of Arabs weren't coming to work. They closed the borders, et cetera. And a lot of people were in Milawim. So between those two uh, groups, Mil the entire hospital had no pharmacists. And we were able to fully staff their hospital with pharmacists within a day. We were able to get our volunteers there. And our, those volunteers eventually got were hired, actually, which is really great. 
Um, you know, on October 8th, we started appealing to um, the Minister of Health to activate the uh, volunteer um, medical registration system for, for foreign volunteers through contacts of ours. I, I developed a lot of Ministry of Health contacts uh, during Corona. I was helping the government with policy regarding OLIM and bringing in family members, et cetera. I, I skipped that whole thing because no one wants to hear about Corona anymore. Um, but um, but I, I, uh, we started doing that because we realized um, that we had to get people in. And as um, somebody who worked in the embassy, uh, now the embassy, um, and worked um, in health policy, I understood what the emergency procedures are in the country because I had access to some of that information and I developed emergency procedures. So, so I, I understood that we need to get these people in um, if they're needed. And, um, and basically um, another phone call we got that first weekend after October 7th was from Naharia Hospital. Now Naharia, as you know, is all the way up on the Lebanese border. It's the northernmost hospital in Israel. And we're still working with them today. I'll tell you about that. Um, and um, what's interesting, and it was, um, they said, we're about to close our hospital and ship all our patients to the Merkaz because we have no health, we have no daycare for the children. The doctors and nurses don't have anyone to watch their kids over the weekend. There's no school, okay? There was no school and um, and they didn't have enough staff. So I networked in with the Naharia community and we were able to fully staff for that entire weekend until the schools restarted using the Bnei Akiva kids they came into the hospital and they babysat for all of the children of the health uh, providers, which meant the hospital was able to stay open. So I'm, Yigal and I are very proud of being able to do some of these things. Um, you know, other things that were going on, think about it, um, old age homes. Um, old age homes um, and rehabilitation facilities have a lot of uh, people who were not able to come into work um, when the war started. A lot of the rehabilitation facilities, a lot of the physical therapists were in Miluim. And we were able to really get the right people to the right place through a system that we created. So we we feel like we really contributed at the beginning of the war to helping the system stay open for everybody else, um, which is very, very critical, of course, because you know the rest, the whole rest of the country were, were trying to help. Um, we started focusing on physicians and, and bringing in physicians. We have over 3,100 physicians who've registered with us, and we've been bringing in physicians. By, by, by bringing in, I want to be very clear, um, we, um, at the beginning of the war, we were registering and, and everyone was getting into the Ministry of Health system. Now um, we work a little differently. We started our nonprofit organization in January. It takes time to establish, um, and it's an American nonprofit. It just takes a lot less time to establish an American nonprofit from an Israeli nonprofit. And um, and what we do is we actually, as as a clinician, I speak the medical lingo to assess the hospital departments that feel they need support. I'm able <clears throat> to talk to the doctors that are in charge and to say, what clinical skills do you need in your department that we can help you with? And then we look at the um, CVs of the doctors who've registered with us and we try to help get appropriate people. The hospital selects them and matches them. And then they request the Ministry of Health license um, and we help with logistics and we help with a lot of the other things that go on. We have orientation programs for our doctors. We teach them some medical Hebrew and they're coming in and doing actual surgery and actual work and anesthesia um, and really, really helping where there are gaps. Remember in, in one hospital, we worked in 50% of the anesthesiologists. This is a huge medical center. 50% were in Miluim. So, you know, what's happening to people who break their leg and need to have surgery or they need a hip replacement or they need open heart surgery, there weren't enough surgeons and there weren't enough anesthesiologists, sorry, it's both to go together. And um, 
And so we were able to fill those gaps and we still are. Um, now the focus that we have um, is in, in two areas. One is we're trying to help the Northern hospitals be prepared for a war. The army has asked and, and Homeland Security, okay, has asked for the Northern hospitals to be prepared, not just for a war that could be long-term, you know, not just a day or two, but long-term, but also that potentially each hospital could be isolated for a week. Now, many of the hospitals in the North don't have every department. You know, for example, there's a hospital in the North that doesn't have a trauma department and they're gonna get in trauma cases and there's no trauma surgeons. So in order to help prepare those hospitals, um, number one, to get um, doctors in to support them when they have potentially uh, Milouim and people are being sucked out of the hospital system, but also to help fill the needs in the departments that are completely not there. So we've been sending in doctors and preparing what we like to call an arm, a medical army for Israel, so that when a war starts, our volunteers have already been oriented to their department. They already have um, knowledge about their hospital, their population. They've already worked. They've already done surgery. They've or, they already know everybody, and they can come in and just we can plop them in and they can start working. Um, and that is very very um, exciting because it really is helping to boost the capabilities and the emergency preparedness of these hospitals, and um, and that's really great. The second thing we're trying to do is to fill in some of the gaps of specialties in Israel where right now there's a huge surge of need like rehabilitation and psychiatric care and to really help to meet those needs also. Because remember that when you're, um, when you're dealing with all of the PTSD that, I mean, the whole country has PTSD, but <clears throat> all of the war injuries um, we don't, on a normal basis, we don't have enough um, uh, rehabilitation specialists. We don't have enough physicians in those areas in psychiatry. So bringing in people to help support those facilities is really, really important. Um, think about Abu Kabir, which is the Forensic Institute. They had to take all of those 1,200 dead Jews and not just Jews, but mostly Jews um, on October 7th and identify them, which is a horrific job. And they just don't have enough personnel to do regular work there because they're dealing with all kinds of um, horrible situations. And it took months to identify everybody. Um, so we're trying to boost and help those areas also. So Hinenu is a wonderful initiative that Yigal and I came up with. And we um, mentioned about the and, name too, by the way, for those that don't know what it means. Hinenu. Sure. Hinenu is uh, from a biblical phrase where God called out to Abraham and he's and and he said, Hineni, I'm here. And it's a way of saying, I'm here. No questions asked. I'll do whatever you want. And that's the attitude of our uh, medical army for Israel is these doctors are clamoring to come. They wanna help. They live outside of the country, most of them. And, um, and they want to feel like they're contributing. No questions asked, they wanna help. And um, I'll put the website on the, um, on the group. We, we, you know, we are a tax deductible organization in the United States. Um, and obviously, you know, we're trying to uh, support the organization and continue our volunteer efforts. But also I, you know, follow us on Facebook and if you could see all of our volunteers and the uh, accomplishments that we have, it's, it's amazing. Uh, we've sent in hundreds of doctors uh, so far and um, it's, it's a great thing. And a lot of Olim, by the way, or people who want to make Aliyah are also our volunteers. So that's really, really exciting. And we're trying to help connect them uh, to the Nefesh Benefesh system so that it can help them make Aliyah. Um, yeah, my and gosh, we're that's working incredible. on it. It's the total spill off that once they get involved in Israel, that even though that wasn't your aim initially, but you're achieving another goal too. 
Correct. And it's uh, a very high percentage of our uh, volunteers have expressed a wish to make Aliyah. And we're actually trying to get their volunteer hours to count towards their um, licensure process after they make Aliyah, which will be really great. Wow, that is phenomenal. Eliana, you Thank are you. a true example. You know, firstly, it's just incredible what you, what you and everyone have done. And and I will say this too, that, you know, Kolaka brought also to your families and uh, your girl's wife, Karen. Hello, Karen. Good to see you. She's my cousin. And thank you also to Karen's mother, Belle, who is here today, who's my cousin. And she told me about Eliana and that's how Eliana is on the show. So thank you to you because you thank were also you. doing amazing stuff, you know, that in addition to the founders and all the doctors and everything, your families have gotten involved, which is incredible that every single one of you was making a difference and your children have got involved and it was just such an important message that you were and we that you and that we can send to the next generation when we get involved and do something. And you know, likewise, Absolutely. I just want to say, and I've said it for, for for many of our different guests, that every single one of us can make a difference. And here is an exact example, Merchus, that you guys are and have and are making a difference. And if we have an idea, not everyone, you know, has the ability to take something and pull something off like you guys did. But what can happen is if we have an idea on how we can help with something, and this can, you know, basically, you know, uh, expand to the whole of Am Israel, is that even if we don't know ourselves what to do, put it out there, put it in a WhatsApp group, put it in a chat group, and somebody else can help you and take your idea and make your idea to fruition. So... Eliana, Yigal, and all of you that have made a difference. Firstly, Kolakavod and, um, and Israel and Am Israel is a better place for having you all here. And thank you so much for what you keep on doing for, for Israel. And as I said, it was wonderful hosting you. You've been a marvelous guest. Kolakavod for everything. And I thank you all for joining and listening to the Monday Motivation Spotlight. And Connect with Eliana and Yigal, whether it's via Facebook, whether it's via donation, if you know anyone else that can volunteer. I thank you also to ACI, our co-hosts, who are behind this program every single week. And I look forward to seeing you next week on the Monday Motivation Spotlight. Stay safe. Another, yes, interesting week. We started off some of the areas with the boom in Israel, and hopefully it'll be quiet as Rosh Hashem this week. So stay safe, stay positive, make that difference, and we look forward to seeing you next week on the Monday Motivation Spotlight. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Thank Bye -bye. you again. Bye.